Hello everybody. Uh, I just wanted to take a few moments to give you an overview of the uh, midterm exam, which is an essay-based exam. I'm going to give you the whole exam um, via email um, as soon as I'm finished with this overview. Okay. Um, given the snow and spring break trip uh, and everything, it's just proven a little bit difficult for us to kind of be physically together to go over this. So um, I'm just going to go over it now. All right. Um, so we're going to do the exam in class next week on Monday, okay? Um, this was actually in the schedule um, to begin with. Uh, I kind of second-guessed myself and thought that I had not prepared for it when, in fact, I actually had prepared for it. <laughs> so, um, so the midterm exam will be um, done in class um, next this upcoming Monday. So what date is that? Um, let's see. So today's the 15th, so on Monday. Um, I don't know what day that is, but it's on Monday, <laughs> the 24th or something like that, uh, when next we meet. Um, so you will have um, all the whole... Um, basically the whole class. Um, it'll be a little bit less than the whole class because I want to go over homework at the end, right? But you'll have all of that time to work on actually physically writing your essay, okay? But before we come into class, um, you have all of the time um, that you like to prepare for your um, essay, okay? So you can read the, the excerpts, you can annotate the excerpts, you can take um, you know notes, um, you can draft out an outline um, for your essays if you like, um, you can look words up, okay? Um, you are on your honor to make sure that your work is your own, right? And not um, you know, not from a website that does an analysis of X, Y, and Z for you, okay? Um, so you are under your honor to make sure that it is your idea, right, that you're writing about rather than Joe Blow on the web's idea that you're writing about, okay? So um, so you can do as much preparation as you like. Um, I strongly encourage you to talk about it with um, friends, um, to come in and see me about it, okay, if, you're, if there's something that you're struggling with in terms of content, okay, um, and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to kind of give you an overview about uh, of what the exam is going to be, okay? So it's worth 100 points. Um, you're basically going to be writing two essays, okay? I'll give you three uh, excerpts, um, a poem and two prose excerpts, okay? And you choose from those three things and write two essays, okay? So for each essay, um, there are a couple requirements, okay? It needs to be thesis-driven, that is, you need to have a point, okay, um, that is clear, debatable, um, interesting, okay, um, and that you support in the essay, okay? So it needs to be thesis-driven, okay? I also like you to provide a very brief but sort of accurate summary, just very general summary of what's happening. What is this thing that I'm writing about about? Okay. Make sure that you give me that context. You can do this in your introduction or your first paragraph. Okay. Um, and then provide an analysis of the piece that uses direct textual evidence to kind of help you make your argument. Okay. Um, so your essays have to draw on at least one of the significant concepts we've discussed in class to help you shape your thesis, right? So basically you're writing two thesis-driven essays, okay, um, and the thesis for each one will be shaped in some way, right, with some reference to a key idea we've discussed in class, okay? So your thesis-driven essays should, one, provide a very brief but accurate summary, sort of sense of what's happening, and then an analysis that helps you support your argument, okay? So these are fairly straightforward essay assignments, as, it, as you would have done for your first essay in this class, okay? Um, so we've talked about a whole bunch of things this term. Um, maybe you've keep, been keeping notes. Um, I hope so. Uh, there are also quite a few... Um, uh, lectures and discussion uh, prezies that are available on our Canvas site uh, for you to, to, to look at again. Okay, So we've talked about a lot of, of things in this class, um, specific themes for individual works, but we've also discussed some very broad topics that um, should help you sort of shape your thesis statements and your responses for each of the excerpts that you're going to be reading. Okay, We talked about manuscript culture okay, and how women used it to avoid um, you know, sort of the taint of print, right, and public uh, buying and selling of, of one's words, okay? Uh, we've talked about the perceptions of women who publish or the perceptions of women who just write, you know, in public, the dangers of having a public voice and making that public voice heard, okay? The demand to constrain that public voice in very particular ways. Um, we've talked about depictions of women in culture, okay? Some depictions that women writers are responding to. 
um, and in some cases taking up. Right? Uh, we've talked about amatory fiction, uh, the key features and goals of amatory fiction. Okay, we talked a lot about domestic fiction as well, particularly with reference to Francis Burney. Okay? Um, and we've talked about epistolarity or letter writing as a vehicle for women's writing. A sort of a key um, form of writing that women were expected and even encouraged to, to engage in, okay? as distinct from, say, writing plays right? <laughs> or amatory fiction. Um, we've also talked about politeness, um, the, the features of politeness, the purpose of politeness, and how it kind of emerges in particularly the domestic fiction um, of uh, uh, the later novelists that we're going to be looking at, like Bernie. Okay? So those are some of the key topics that we've talked about. Okay? So when you're writing your essays, keep in mind that I'm going to be grading on a couple things. Okay, um, I'm not going to be grading on spelling. Okay, I'm not going to be grading on spelling. I'm not going to be grading on grammar. Okay, um, but I do require that your essay is understandable to me. Okay, and legible to me. So if there's a point at which the the language is is really problematic, okay, that might cause some concern for me. Okay. So, um, so I will be grading it on the strength of your thesis, which you come up with, okay? Um, the accuracy of your summary section, okay? What's happening here? What is this about, right? Um, and the quality of your analysis, okay? But I am also um, evaluating the strength of your essay as an argument, okay? So you need to be persuasive and well-organized and use the best evidence to support your thesis, okay? So I'm not deducting for spelling or anything like that, um, but if your if your your writing is you know problematic in certain ways that inhabit in, inhibit legibility right um, then that will mean you're not going to be quite as persuasive as you might otherwise be okay so so you would want to um, you know take care that as you're preparing for this you have a good sense of sort of what you're doing okay because because um, um, mastery, right, comes with um, with a sense of, of of true knowledge. Okay, so if you if you feel like you really understand what's happening and what you're saying, and you're really behind it, and you um, are kind of going for it. Okay, um, then then your writing, ideally, right, will be clearer. Okay, so those two things are sort of tied together, right? Um, a couple notes just to sort of put your mind at ease and clarify a little bit. Your brief summary, okay, I keep mentioning this, it just, it needs to be brief, very brief, um, but it should be accurate, okay? You might just start with a clear statement of the topic. What is being discussed? What is this thing that I'm reading about? Who's talking to whom, why, right? <laughs> what are they talking about? Um, where does it occur, right? Um, point out very generally what happens, okay? Um, what's happening in the poem with the characters, sorry, in, in the, the, um, the, the novels or the amatory fictions, right, with the characters. Or in the case of the poem, you know, what is the author generally trying to say? Okay, very, very generally, okay? This is really just to make sure that I have a sense that you, you know, know what, what's being discussed, okay? Um, incidentally, this will also be useful for crafting your thesis. Okay, so, so your summary should be very brief, okay, but it should be accurate, okay, you don't need to go into immense detail about every last little detail in terms of what happens and who's that and who's that and who's that, but make sure that, you know, you can convey to me a sense that you know what's generally happening in this piece, okay. Um, second of all, um, keep in mind that you don't need to analyze all the parts of the text, okay. Um, you can select the elements that really help you articulate your thesis, Okay, you don't have to talk about everything in the excerpt, okay? But your brief summary should, you know, give your reader a sense that you do understand what's being said overall, okay? So that's why that brief summary is there, so that you don't have to say everything about every last detail, you know, in the excerpt, okay? So it allows you to select, all right? Um, okay, so just very briefly again, you're going to be given three um, pieces, okay? Um, you choose two of them and write a thesis-driven essay for each one um, that uh, draws in its thesis for its argument, right, on one significant concept that we've discussed in class to help, help you shape your thesis, okay? And each of your essays should provide a brief but accurate sort of overview, contextualization, um, and then an analysis of the piece that uses direct textual evidence, okay, to make you, help you make your argument, okay? Um, so those are the, those are the, that's the, the nature of the exam, okay? It's a writing intensive class, so we're going to be writing an essay for essays for your midterm, okay? So um, I am going to also um, 
take a little bit of time to actually read the pieces for you, okay? So I'm gonna just stop this right now and then I will put this video together in um, a second uh, so you can um, uh, so you can follow along with me on the screen as I'm reading the excerpts, okay? Okay, so uh, here's the exam, which I just went over and uh, which I will also uh, make available to you electronically. Um, when you come in on Monday to take the exam, you can bring with you this exam itself with all of the excerpts on it, okay? You can annotate your excerpts, mark them up in any way, underline things, highlight things, make little notations in the margin, etc., etc. Um, and you can also bring in an outline for each of the two essays that you're going to be writing. Okay, well, we'll do all the writing in class. Okay? So uh, I wanted to take just a little bit of time to go over the pieces um, that you can work with uh, because uh, that will help with comprehension and also um, you know, hearing these um, read aloud for you can, as we've seen with Love and Excess, um, really help you get a handle on what's being said. Okay? So I'm just going to go over each of the three excerpts very briefly and I'll read them aloud for you so that you can have a little bit more purchase on them, okay? So the first poem, uh, the first piece that you can work with is a poem uh, called The Apology that's written by a woman named Anne Finch, um, the Countess of Winchelsea. Uh, she is an aristocratic woman who wrote um, in a coterie. Uh, so this is a poem that is, an, uh, that is part of the manuscript culture of the 17th century. Um, and uh, she did publish it during her lifetime much later in um, a collection of poems called Miscellany Poems that was published in 1713, okay? Um, but this is an example of a poem that was written much earlier and circulated in manuscript. She probably wrote it maybe around the 1680s, 1690s, okay? So in the late part of the 17th century. Uh, the title is, uh, it has a specific meaning, okay, so make sure you look up the word and understand what it means. Take a look and notice that there are also footnotes here for you, okay? Um, so here's the poem. It's called The Apology. Tis true I write, and tell me by what rule I am alone forbid to play the fool, to follow through the groves a wandering muse and feigned ideas for my pleasures choose. Why should it in my pen be held a fault whilst Mira paints her face to paint a thought, whilst Lamia to the manly bumper flies and borrowed spirits sparkle in her eyes? Why should it be in me a thing so vain to heat with poetry my colder brain? But I write ill and therefore should forbear. Does Flavia cease now at her fortieth year in every place to let that face be seen which all the town rejected at fifteen? Each woman has her weakness. Mine, indeed, is still to write, though hopeless to succeed. Nor to the men is this so easy found, even in most works with which the wits abound. So weak are all since our first breach with heaven. There's less to be applauded than forgiven. So that is her poem, The Apology. Okay. The second piece um, is an excerpt from Haywood's amatory fiction, Phantomina, Love and Amaze, which uh, was published in print in the 18th century, 1725. So this is an example of amatory fiction, and um, it was uh, circulating in the print marketplace, which we also heard about when we went to London. Okay. Indefatigable in the pursuit of whatsoever her humor was bent upon, she had no sooner left her new engaged emissaries than she went in search of a house for the completing her project. She pitched on one very large and magnificently furnished, which she hired by the week, giving them the money beforehand to prevent any inquiries. The next day she repaired to the park where she met the punctual squires of low degree, and ordering them to follow her to the house she had taken, told them they must condescend to appear like servants, and gave each of them a very rich livery. Then, writing a letter to Beauplaisir in a character vastly different from either of those she had made use of as Phantomina or the fair widow Bloomer, ordered one of them to deliver it into his own hands, to bring back an answer, and to be careful that he sifted out nothing of the truth. The messenger made what haste he could to the house of Beauplaisir, and, being there told where he might find him, performed exactly the injunction he had been given. But never astonishment exceeding that which Beauplaisir felt at the reading this billet, in which he found these lines. To the all-conquering Beauplaisir. 
I imagine not that tis a new thing to you to be told you are the greatest charm in nature to our sex. I shall, therefore, not to fill up my letter with an impertinent praise on your wit or person, only tell you that I am in infinite love with you, and you, if you have a heart not too deeply engaged, should think myself the happiest of my sex in being capable of inspiring it with some tenderness. There is but one thing in my power to refuse you, which is the knowledge of my name, which, believing the sight of my face will render no secret, you must not take it ill that I conceal from you. The bearer of this is a person I can trust. Send by him your answer, but endeavor not to dive into the meaning of this mystery, which will be impossible for you to unravel, and at the same time very much disoblige me. But that you may be in no apprehensions of being opposed on by a woman unworthy of your regard, I will venture to assure you the first and greatest men in the kingdom would think themselves blessed to have that influence over me you have, though unknown to yourself, acquired." But I need not go about to raise your curiosity by giving you any idea of what my person is. If you think fit to be satisfied, resolve to visit me tomorrow about three in the afternoon, and though my face is hid, you shall not want sufficient demonstration that she who takes these unusual measures to commence a friendship with you is neither old nor deformed. Till then I am yours, incognita. He had scarce come to the conclusion before he asked the person who brought it, from what place he came, the name of the lady he served, if she were a wife or a widow, and several other questions directly opposite to the directions of the letter. But silence would have availed him as much as did all those testimonies of curiosity. No Italian bravo employed in a business of the like nature performed his office with more artifice, and the impatient inquirer was convinced that nothing but doing as, was, as he was desired could give him any light into the character of the woman who declared so violent a passion for him, and, little fearing any consequence which could ensue from such an encounter, resolved to rest satisfied till he was informed of everything from herself, not imagining this incognita varied so much from the generality of her sex as to be able to refuse the knowledge of anything to the man she loved with that transcendency of passion she professed, and which his many successes with the ladies gave him encouragement enough to believe. He therefore took pen and paper, and answered her letter in terms tender enough for a man who had never seen the face of the person to whom he wrote. Okay, so that is from Haywood's Phantomina. Okay, the third piece is uh, an excerpt from Frances Burney's novel Evelina, or the history of a young lady's entrance into the world. This also was published in print um, in the 18th century, um, much later, 1778. Okay, um, This is an epistolary novel, of course, meaning it was written in letters. Um, this is letter 46. Evelina is writing to the Reverend Mr. Villers. She is writing um, June 17th from a place called Holborn, which is in London, as we saw from our experiences last week. Yesterday, Mr. Smith carried his point of making a party for Vauxhall, consisting of Madame Duval, Monsieur Dubois, all the Brentons, Mr. Brown himself, and me, for I find all endeavors vain to escape anything which these people desire I should not. There were twenty disputes previous to our setting out, First, as to the time of our going, Mr. Branton, his son, and young Brown were for six o'clock, and all the ladies and Mr. Smith were for eight. The latter, however, conquered. Then, as to the way we should go, some were for a boat, others for a coach, and Mr. Branton himself was for walking, but the boat at length was decided upon. Indeed, this was the only part of the expedition that was agreeable to me, for the Thames was delightfully pleasant. The garden is very pretty, but too formal. I should have been better pleased had it consisted less of straight walks, where grove nods at grove, each alley has its brother. The trees, the numerous lights, and the company in the circle round the orchestra make a most brilliant and gay appearance, and had I been with a party less disagreeable to me, I should have thought it a place formed for animation and pleasure. There was a concert, in the course of which a hautboy concerto was so charmingly played that I could have thought myself upon enchanted ground had I spirits more gentle to associate with. The hautboy in the open air is heavenly. Mr. Smith endeavored to attach himself, attach himself to me with such officious assiduity and impertinent freedom that he quite sickened me. Indeed, Monsieur Dubois was the only man of the party to whom, voluntarily, I ever addressed myself. 
He is civil and respectful, and I have found nobody else ever, nobody else so, since I left Howard Grove. His English is very bad, indeed, but I prefer it to speaking French myself, which I dare not venture to do. I converse with him frequently, both to disengage myself from others and to oblige Madame Duval, who is always pleased when he is attended to. As we were walking about the orchestra, I heard a bell ring, and in a moment Mr. Smith, flying up to me, caught my hand, and with a motion too quick to be resisted, ran away with me many yards before I had breath to ask his meaning, though I struggled as well as I could to get from him. At last, however, I insisted upon stopping. Stopping, ma'am, cried he, why, we must run on or we shall lose the cascade. And then again he hurried me away, mixing with a crowd of people, all running with so much velocity that I could not imagine what had raised such an alarm. We were soon followed by the rest of our party, and my surprise and ignorance proved a source of diversion to them all, which was not exhausted the whole evening. Young Brenton, in particular, laughed till he could hardly stand. Scene of the cascade I thought extremely pretty, and the general effect striking and lively. But this was not the only surprise which was to divert them at my expense, for they led me about the garden purposely to enjoy my first sight of various other deceptions. About ten o'clock, Mr. Smith, having, cho having chosen a box in a very conspicuous place, we all went to supper. Much fault was found with everything that was ordered, though not a morsel of anything was left, and the dearness of the provisions with conjectures upon what profit was made by them supplied discourse during the whole meal. When wine and cider were brought, Mr. Smith said, Now let's enjoy ourselves. Now is the time or never. Well, ma'am, and how do you like Vauxhall? Like it, cried young, young Branton. Why, how could she help liking it? She has never seen any such place before. That I'll answer for. For my part, said Miss Branton, I like it because it is not vulgar. This must have been a fine treat for you, miss, said Mr. Branton. Why, I suppose you was never so happy in all your life before. I endeavored to express my satisfaction with some pleasure, yet I believe they were much amazed at my coldness. Miss ought to stay in town to the last night, said young Branton, and then it's my belief she'd see something to it. She'd say something to it. Why, Lord, it's the best night of any. There's always a riot, and them folks running about, their folks run about, and then there's such squealing and squalling, and there all the lamps are broke, and the women run, skimper, scamper. I declare it would not take five guineas to miss the last night. I declare I would not take five guineas to miss the last night. I was very glad when they all grew tired of sitting and called for the waiter to pay the bill. The Miss Brenton said they would walk on while the gentleman settled the account and asked me to accompany them, which, however, I declined. You girls may do as you please, said Madame Duval, but as to me, I promise you I shan't go nowhere without the gentleman. No more, I suppose, will my cousin, said Miss Brenton, looking reproachfully toward Mr. Smith. This reflection, which I feared would flatter his vanity, made me most unfortunately request Madame Duval's permission to attend them. She granted it, and away we went, having promised to meet in the room. To the room, therefore, I would immediately have gone, but the sisters agreed that they would first have a little pleasure, and they tittered and talked so loud that they attracted universal notice. "'Lord, Polly,' said the eldest, "'suppose we were to take a turn in the dark walks.' I do, answered she, and then we'll hide ourselves, and then Mr. Brown will think we are lost. I remonstrated very warmly against this plan, telling them it would endanger our missing the rest of the party all the evening. Oh, dear, cried Miss Brenton, I thought how uneasy Miss would be without a bow. This impertinence I did not think worth answering, and by quite by compulsion I followed them down a long alley in which there was hardly any light. By the time we came near the end, a large party of gentlemen, apparently very riotous, and who were hallooing, leaning on one another, and laughing immoderately, seemed to rush suddenly from behind some trees, and meeting us face to face, there put their arms at their sides, and formed a kind of circle, which first stopped our proceeding, and then our retreating, for we were presently entirely enclosed. The Miss Brenton screamed aloud, and I was frightened exceedingly. Our screams were answered with bursts of laughter, and for some minutes we were kept prisoners, till at last one of them, rudely seizing hold of me, said I was a pretty little creature. Terrified to death, I struggled with such vehemence to disengage myself from him that I succeeded, in spite of his efforts to detain me, and immediately, and with a swiftness which fear only could have given me, I flew rather than ran up the walk, hoping to secure my safety by returning to the lights and company we had so foolishly left. 
but before I could possibly accomplish my purpose, I was met by another party of men, one of whom placed himself so directly in my way, calling out, Whither so fast, my love, that I could only have proceeded by running into his arms. In a moment, both my hands, by different purses, were caught hold of, and one of them, in a most familiar manner, desired, when I ran next, to accompany me in a race, while the rest of the party stood still and laughed. I was almost distracted with terror, and so breathless with running, that I could not speak, till another, advancing, said I was as handsome as an angel, and desired to be of the party. I then just articulated, For heaven's sake, gentlemen, let me pass! Another, then rushing suddenly forward, exclaimed, Heaven and earth, what voice is that? The voice of the prettiest little actress I have seen this age, answered one of my persecutors. No, 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 I panted out. I am no actress. Pray let me go. Pray let me pass. By all that's sacred, cried the same voice, which I then knew for Sir Clement Willoughby's, tis herself. Sir Clement Willoughby, cried I, oh, sir, assist me, assist me, or I shall die with terror. Gentlemen, cried he, disengaging them all from me in an instant, pray leave this lady to me. Loud laughs proceeded from every mouth, and two or three said, oh, Willoughby has all the luck, but one of them in a passionate manner vowed he would not give me up, for that he had the first right to me and would support it. Okay. Um, so the rest of the, the letter goes on, it continues on, um, and um, she has generally a terrible time at Vauxhall, and um, I've only excerpted this first part for you, okay? So, um, so there you have an excerpt from Bernie's novel Evelina, an excerpt from Haywood's amatory fiction Phantomina, and the poem uh, by Anne Finch called The Apology, which is an example of uh, manuscript culture and uh, poetic coterie writing. So um, remember that you will be writing two essays. You'll choose two of the three excerpts that I've given you, and you'll write an essay for each one of them. It should be a thesis-driven essay that provides a very brief but accurate sort of general summary, as I mentioned earlier, and then an analysis of the piece that uses direct textual evidence to help you make your argument. Your essays should draw, must draw on at least one of those significant concepts that we've discussed in class to help you shape your thesis and your analysis, right? Um, so use what you've learned in class to help you with your close reading and your literary analysis, okay? All right, so let me know if you have any questions. Um, you should all have my cell phone number from our trip last week. Uh, if you have already deleted it, uh, which I don't blame you if you did, um, I'll give it to you again. It's 202-271-5149. And um, you can feel free to call me if you have any questions, um, or you can drop by my office tomorrow or Friday, okay? Um, so that is the midterm exam. I will be sending it out as soon as I finish with this recording. All right. Thank you very much.